Welcome to Connecting Communities. I'm your host, Nancy Bacci. With me today is Brian Bishop, the Director of Veteran Services for the city. Thank you so much for coming on, Brian. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Nancy. Excellent. It's a nice way to kick off New Year, first show of the year. Absolutely. And as always, we're happy to talk about the important services provided to our servicemen and women. So Absolutely. first off, I'd like to thank you for your service. Oh, thank you very much for the acknowledgement. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> we would like to start a little bit about your background. So if you could touch briefly on your career in the service. Um, well, uh, originally I'm from North Carolina. Uh, I would you, never as, have as you, guessed. You, I probably never would have guessed that. <laughs> um, I still say Kai and Yad. I've lived here for 25 years, so, you know, I've been around. <laughs> um, but um, my position in the Air Force was very interesting because I've, I'm not a combat veteran. However, I was a principal vocalist for the United States Air Force Band Program uh, and also played piano. Um, so I did that for about six and a half years, and then I was an Air Force recruiter for four years in Waltham. So you see a pattern here, I never left New England. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I came in the military, I asked him, I said, you know, I was picking my jobs I want, or my places I wanted to go, my dream sheet, as they called it. Mm -hmm. Everywhere was like warm and wonderful, yeah. like Hawaii and whatnot, and they sent me here. Um, so um, I spent two decades in the Northeast, but uh, after being a recruiter in Waltham, I went back to the Air Force Band at Hanscom uh, and uh, finished it out there as the Director of Operations and uh, had an opportunity to travel all over the world, had an opportunity to travel throughout the Northeast and basically spread America's musical message. And, and patriotism and heritage, it was so important to us. And it was very interesting because some of the communities we went into, they'd never seen anyone in uniform before, mm. like a, that group, uh, mm -hmm. a, a group that large, because there were 60 of us that would go into wow. this org uh, into these towns uh, with a concert band that we sent out. And that's the first time they would see like a huge group of, mm -hmm. of military people. So it was fantastic. It also got, gave me an opportunity to see what the veterans community was like in mm -hmm. these communities. And I never thought that I would actually be director of veteran services for a city in, in my life. I, my track was to go nursing and mm -hmm. uh, pediatric nursing specifically. Um, and it just, the road changed and it changes as you know all the time. Mm -hmm. And that leads me here. Uh, to Somerville after three years in Boston as Deputy Commissioner and Chief of Staff uh, to now Secretary Francisco Urena, who's our Secretary for Veterans Affairs. Um, now I'm here in Somerville and dedicated to ensuring that all of our service, me our service members as well as our veterans and their families get the benefits and services they deserve. They serve this country for us. Now it's time for us to serve them. Excellent. Thank you Thanks. for that bit of background. Uh, it's quite an interesting evolution that you've traveled. I'm hopeful if we have a few minutes at the end, we can hear maybe a few stories about some of the journeys along that sure. road. One thing I did want to touch upon that you had mentioned was the idea of music. So it's such a unifying entity. Yes. You know, as you said, coming into communities that weren't as familiar or perhaps didn't know that there was this whole musical component to the service and realizing, you know, it's such a way to bring people together. Yes. And even I'm thinking specifically of like language barriers, you know, you can still enjoy the music. I was at an event last night that this amazing group of young people performed songs in Haitian Creole mm -hmm. and I, I don't understand the lyrics, right. <laughs> but you're able to just be such a part of it because of the melody and the music and it's just such a way to engage without, you know, <coughs> worrying about all of those other factors. It's almost like they melt away. You can just become mm -hmm. one with the experience. So I'm really looking forward to you bringing those skills to the city. Absolutely. Uh, that's something we did in Boston. Um, our Memorial Day uh, was just basically Memorial Day week was just tons and tons of ceremonies in all mm -hmm. the neighborhoods in Boston. Um, when I first came on board, Secretary Urena says, you got to fix Memorial Day. I don't have that problem <laughs> here because um, we have the parade. But, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, um, the, uh, the thing that we were looking was to unify mm -hmm. exactly what you said. Bring everyone together, families, older veterans, younger veterans, non-veterans, mm -hmm. um, people who just love music, right. and bring them together to re- introduce them to what Memorial Day is. It's not barbecues mm -hmm. and beach balls. It's not a Very celebration. True. It is a remembrance of those who gave their, what Lincoln said, their last full measure of devotion mm -hmm. in defense of their country. And that's what it's all about. And I think that when we put that all to music, I mean, no one wants to go sit and listen to someone talk for an hour. But, no. what they, but if, you, if you take that same speech and you put a musical track behind it mm -hmm. or a huge musical organization behind it, you just change the entire dynamic and people will get what you're trying to say a mm -hmm. lot easier than, you know, if you're just standing up there trying to talk to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm excited. And uh, there's going to be, there'll be many times where, you know, <laughs> excuse me, it'll be like, oh, Brian's here. There will be music. Yeah, there will be. 
<laughs> well, I think that's a wonderful thing because, as I said, I really think it's uh, something that can be enjoyed by everyone. So yeah. any opportunity to inject it into things I think is amazing. Um, you did have the opportunity to sing at the mayor's inauguration at the beginning of this month, which was kind of a nice way to introduce you to the larger community yes. as well. That was great. That, that was an honor and a privilege mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to talk a bit about the services that are available for our veterans. So mm -hmm. your office is sited at 50 Evergreen Ave, which is City Hall Annex, yep. and it consists of you and Kathy Carey, who Absolutely. is your administrative assistant. The great Kathy and Carey. <laughs> wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful woman who's really such a breath of knowledge, mm -hmm. which is really great in a position yeah. such as this. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about what veterans and their families can expect if they make an appointment to come in and see you. I've always said veteran service officers in the Commonwealth serve two masters. We serve the state we serve the uh, Department of Veteran Services for the state, mm -hmm. which our secretary, and we serve the mayor and, and the city of Somerville as a whole. Um, so our mandate is to administer the public assistance funds for Mass General Law Chapter 115. Mm -hmm. Now what people don't understand is, is Mass General Law Chapter 115 is a law on the books that states is that we will provide public assistance to veterans and their families who qualify. Um, we are the only state in the United States of America who have this law on the books. Now you think about 50 states, you right. think about all of the millions of people who've served this country, mm -hmm. and Massachusetts, little old Massachusetts sitting up in the Northeast is the only state that actually has a law on the books that says that our veterans will have a veteran service officer in every city and every town be represented and that they will get the benefits and services by the state that they so richly deserve. And that's, that's pretty, amazing. it is amazing, it is, it's, it's sad. It, mm -hmm. And in my opinion, it's disgusting because we're thinking that, um, when so many people have come home mm -hmm. and you go to states like Texas and Florida and California and places where there's such a huge predominance of veterans mm -hmm. and all they have basically is the VA. They mm -hmm. do have veteran services departments but they right. don't provide a financial aspect except through the VA. And that's so such a great need. It's oh, amazing to think that that's not now. being addressed. Especially now. Um, in addition to you know administering the uh, the public assistance side of it, we have about 68 people in the city of Somerville on our rolls. Mm -hmm. I came from Boston, we had 600. <laughs> so this is great. I actually get to meet mm -hmm. every single one of my clients, uh, which is what I'm, I told Doug and I also told uh, Bill Roach when they hired me. My first 100 days is to sit and find every mm -hmm. single veteran that I serve currently through the public assistance program and get to know them. Mm -hmm. And if you can't come to my office, I'll come to your house. Right. And a lot of them are loving that, especially yeah. right now. Um, <laughs> so on the other side, we also will file claims with the, with the Veterans Administration. We'll actually start paperwork with them so that they can um, see what kind of services they can get from the VA. Uh, I refer people to organizations, nonprofits for mental health counseling, for housing, for employment. Mm -hmm. um, those types of things. Basically, my office is a clearinghouse. I am the focal point for veteran services in the city of, of Somerville. I am the mayor's voice for veterans, um, for veterans issues within the city of Somerville. Mm -hmm. I are to articulate his message that he wants for his veterans down to the veterans and their families. Um, and um, also try to keep people aware of the changes, many of them daily mm -hmm. uh, changes for benefits and services that they are actually entitled to, mm -hmm. that they have no idea what's out there. And nope. at the end of the day, we honor those who have gone on, who passed away uh, with um, you know, ceremonies and services mm -hmm. uh, for families, for veterans who you know, have died. I think that comes to light not as often as it should, but every now and again you'll see a newspaper article or there'll be something on the news saying, here's this benefit that's available to mm -hmm. veterans. And it's sad that this is kind of the first way that people are hearing about this, you yeah. know, and as you said, these people have devoted their time and their lives mm -hmm. to this and are not able to utilize all the advantages that should be shown to them. So Absolutely. it's great that, you know, you have the, you're new into this mm -hmm. position, mm -hmm. which I think always brings a sort of energy. Like you said, I'm so excited that yeah. you are like, I want to meet these people because, you know, reading a file is one thing, but actually meeting the person and kind of getting mm -hmm. a feel for Absolutely. what's going on. I mean, a file contains a lot of words. Exactly. You know, I mean, your status is this or your status is that, right. but there's a whole other thing going on behind mm -hmm. that. So I really appreciate the fact that you spend the time to do this. Absolutely. So with being new on the job mm -hmm. and, you know, not having all of the days in yet, mm -hmm. have you been able to identify a pressing concern so far or kind of what you're hearing even anecdotally from our servicemen and women? 
Actually, for Somerville proper, no. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I know that coming out of Boston, we were in the middle of an, initi an initiative that the mayor took on a challenge from the First Lady. Mm -hmm. um, it they called it First 25 Cities uh, mm -hmm. to End Veteran Homelessness by the end of oh. this past year. Wow. Um, some cities did it, some were still working on it. Um, veteran homelessness is the top priority right now. Mm -hmm. among, with that being also opiate addiction, and drug, you know, uh, substance abuse, mm -hmm. and um, PTSD, mental health. Right. I mean, those are always in there. Mm -hmm. um, but the homelessness issue around the country has been horrible. Mm -hmm. um, Boston housed 540 veterans in 18 months. That's amazing. That is amazing. Um, now what they're looking at is that because Boston is like the hub of that's mm -hmm. where they go because the right. New England Center for Homeless Veterans is there. Uh, they have an, a wraparound services available to them mm -hmm. there. But what we're, they're looking to do now is go through the list and find out where these people actually came from and try to repatriate them back to their towns, oh, okay. and which means that's going to come back to me. Mm -hmm. The problem that we have in the Northeast, definitely the greater Boston area, is affordable housing. Oh, the mayor yes. said it in his speech. You know, yes. uh, it, even the president talks about it all the time as well. Affordable housing, in, especially in this area, is so difficult to find. Mm -hmm. um, when you are a landlord and you find someone who will pay market value for your house, even though our veterans might have what's called a VASH voucher from the mm -hmm. VA, they can come in with that. Well, they're not going to get the market value for their, for their property. Right. So that's what they're looking at. We sometimes try to appeal to their inner self and say, you know, this is you're doing something for a veteran. And mm -hmm. then you try to give them some incentives. And those are some things that I will be working with, uh, whether it be some of housing, whether it be the mayor's office, whether it be other places. If we start seeing a influx back mm -hmm. to the city, it's to work with that. Because there are people out there who would be willing to rent, you know, to rent to of veterans. Course. Um, especially if they know that they're getting their money, but the veterans get wrapped around services, uh, supportive services, mm -hmm. but the landlord needs them too. So right. they need to know, be able to pick up the phone and say, hey, I have an issue here and someone's going to be right there to take care mm -hmm. of it. Um, Somerville small enough that we could definitely do that. And, you know, we work in a cross collaborative environment here, which I think is fantastic. Boston has started doing it for a long time. Veteran services was just kind of like an outlier, you mm -hmm. know, up under the mayor's office and, you know, Every time, you know, Memorial Day, Veterans Day came up, oh, Veterans Office does some things and a few people come to see them. But now Veterans Services has been pulled back into Health and Human Services, it's been pulled back into the fold, as I say, mm -hmm. and we all work together because you have veterans in almost every single department. Right. So these are the things that we can work on together. But, the, but to circle back, Veterans Homelessness is my, is my key point. We have the North Street uh, Mass Bay uh, Veterans Center mm -hmm. over on North Street here in town. I've been out to meet them already. I've, actually going out there Saturday, have a football thing going on, so I'm going to go meet with them there. But these people are in transitional housing. These mm -hmm. people have come back to us, and they're trying to get to sustainable housing, but it's very difficult to do. They have their VASH vouchers. More than likely, they're not going to be living here. We mm -hmm. sent a ton of veterans to Lynn, Massachusetts, um, from Boston because we didn't have anything for them, but they had an entire 27-unit building that mm -hmm. they filled up in three months. Wow. So, I mean, these are the type of things that we're looking at. So it's no longer a Somerville issue, it's no longer a Boston issue, mm -hmm. it's a Commonwealth issue. Oh, and it's a national issue because veteran and homelessness, those are two words that never should be in the same sentence. I'm going to have t-shirts made on that because it's, it's true. I mean, you think of someone who has given up their life, gone out, supported this country, mm -hmm. who have put their lives on the line, have watched friends die, mm -hmm. um, all in the name of freedom and, and democracy, and then they come home, and mm -hmm. life for them, for us, has gone on. Right. But for them, it stops, mm -hmm. and they come home, and nothing's the same anymore. And they're like, "Wow, what am I going to do?" So they have all kinds of issues anyway, mm -hmm. emotionally, physically, right. you know, psychologically. But then they come back, and they can't su they can't support themselves. Mm -hmm. And basically, it was kind of like, "Whoop, thanks a lot. Have a nice day." We can't do that anymore. Well, it's interesting, too, as you said, so many of the issues that you raised are being addressed on regional levels. I mean, the homelessness issue is unbelievable everywhere. Yes. You know, I think that's an important lens to look at things through, which is, you know, we're not saying, like, this is a Somerville problem or this is a Massachusetts mm -hmm. problem. A lot of these, I mean, these are national problems Absolutely. with homelessness, the substance use, the mental health concerns, and the impact all of those components have on the other things. It's difficult to maintain your ability to stay in safe, sustainable housing when you have other issues happening Absolutely. that put that into jeopardy. And if you're not able to seek 
substance abuse treatment because of the mental health issues that are going untreated. All of these things just continue to ricochet off of each other and really put you in such jeopardy. And another point that came to mind when you had mentioned um, the idea of putting people back into the neighborhoods they originated from, whether it's the potential to reconnect with families, which in some instances may be more reasonable than others based on circumstance, but at least I'm wondering the familiarity of your surroundings. That must bring some measure of comfort in, as you said, people who are experiencing PTSD, substance abuse issues, at least that sense of familiarity must bring some modicum of comfort to you, I would imagine, at least in terms of feeling reconnected. And there's the potential to walk down the street and, you know, pick up a sandwich mm -hmm. in the store you went to as a right. kid or see a neighbor or walk past your former parish church. Mm -hmm. At least there's something that could kind of create a support structure, mm -hmm. which I, I think is so I, critical. I think you're absolutely right. And even though it's a great idea and I think that we'll find some kind of success with it, mm -hmm. but what we need to do is it's just not going to be a veteran services issue. Mm -hmm. it, it goes back to right. being a, a city issue, it comes back to being a community issue. Um, to take a veteran and to embrace them for their service, faults and all. Mm -hmm. um, to reconnect them with family. We do find a lot of that. I know in Boston we found tons of situations where, you know, these veterans are homeless, living in the shelter, and it's like, do you have family or anything? So like, my daughter won't speak to me. My family mm -hmm. has nothing to do with me anymore um, because it has gotten so bad mm -hmm. that family just turns their back on you, and there's like, I, we can't deal with this anymore. Right. And by that point, you've just got so many multiple issues. It's, t it's, it's hard to really get through and pull it all out and fix it. Mm -hmm. It can be done, but it takes a lot of time, and unfortunately, it takes a lot of money, and budget-wise, it's, it's mm -hmm. tough. Uh, the VA has been doing a great job at trying to better their image. I will say this, that VA Boston has gotten higher marks than any other VA in the country. They do Good. outstanding work there. They're dedicated. Uh, they were not part of that whole mess that we had mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago. Uh, I had dealt with them very closely on a lot of issues, and they're looking to move forward to help, you know, helping people, whether it be substance abuse. Uh, the, huge, the huge part I think they see here with the substance abuse and the mental um, issues, they're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. You know, self-medication, you're not so much more alcoholics anymore as pill poppers and people who would just find anything they can mm -hmm. to make the pain go away. Um, you have the vet centers now, in, in Boston has a vet center, um, which is kind of a stepping stone to the VA. It's not the VA, mm -hmm. but it's federally funded. Okay. And it, they provide counseling. They provide employment help. So, I mean, there's a lot of places for people to go mm -hmm. to get the help and services that they need, more so than they ever have. That's, well, that's why, encouraging Which news. is encouraging, which is why we don't, have, we don't have very many of our young Iraq Afghanistan veterans pulling Chapter 115 funds mm -hmm. um, because they got their VA stuff before they even got out. Now right. they tell them six months before you leave, file your claims. So by the time they get out, mm -hmm. hopefully they're getting their compensation and most of them are over budget for us, but my job is just not to write a check for people. Mm -hmm. I want people coming to my office. I want people to come and sit down with me and say, you know, I was thinking of this or I was thinking of that and, you know, I want to reconnect with these veterans and right. things like that. This is what I want. The dialogue has to be both ways, but it has to be intergenerational. Um, mm -hmm. Our, you know, we have a lot of older veterans, uh, our seniors who are on Chapter 115 benefits because they're on ch fixed incomes. Right. We have widows who are on our Chapter 115 benefits. But right now I have very few, I don't have an exact number, uh, but I will, uh, of exactly how many Iraq Afghanistan veterans I have. But I, maybe I'd say maybe 15 or 20. Well, yeah. that kind of leads to my next question, which was, you know, the differences between what we think of as the older generation mm -hmm. of veterans and the new returning servicemen mm -hmm. and women. And kind of the work that's been done, I think, about stigma reduction, right? So um, if you look at some of our older members, there's still that resistance in some instances <laughs> where, you know, you're not as willing to come and say, I'm struggling with whatever it is, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. I'm struggling with depression. I just don't feel like myself. I'm concerned about pain management, any of those things are sometimes harder for people of an older generation to be as open about. I think what we're seeing more with younger servicemen and women is, as you said, it's kind of just been ingrained from the very beginning, Absolutely. which is there is no shame in admitting that you need assistance in any area. And I think the willingness to accept services sometimes varies as well. So while it's usually encouraging to kind of hear the laundry list of services that are available, I think work still needs to be done to make people realize 
it's okay to seek those services right. in any circumstance. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, you hit on a little something there. You talk about intergenerational again. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to other demographics. Women veterans, mm -hmm. huge, um, huge initiatives. Of, the Commonwealth has a women's veterans network um, that do great work. Um, you've got the Iraq Afghanistan, you've got Hispanic veterans, you've got African American veterans, you've got LGBT veterans now, mm -hmm. which for the very first time in the last four years are actually making a resurgence. Um, I founded an LGBT veterans organization uh, in 2014 called OutVets. Mm -hmm. And we have, I mean, you talk intergenerational. I've got one kid who's 19 years old mm -hmm. who's at the Navy Yard here in Boston, and I have a gentleman who actually was at West Point in 1958. Wow. And I have everything <laughs> in between. I yeah. have a lot of Vietnam vets mm -hmm. who are a part of this organization. It's the most underrepresented demographic in the veterans community only because Don't Ask, Don't Tell mm -hmm. repeal yes. was in 2011. So we're still, still kind of doing we're still the trying to get there and that, people are trying yeah. to get, you know, get involved with it. Mm -hmm. But um, that organization was the first LGBT veterans groups to march in St. Patrick's Day Parade in South Boston last year. And we actually got invited this year. We got our paperwork and were invited to be a part of it. Right. And we never thought that would ever happen, but it, but it has. So when you talk about the young vets, the older vets, um, uh, gay, straight, women, male, you know, the mm -hmm. whole nine yards. My, my desire is to bring those veterans mm -hmm. together. Serve everyone. Not, exactly, not, not as a, this type and that, mm -hmm. but as a veteran. veteran. You know, and I think everyone will learn so much more from each other. Mm -hmm. The young people can learn from the older oh, generations. The, young, the older generation can learn from the younger ones, especially when it comes to things like, can you teach me how to do Facebook? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Someone <laughs> needs to help program the smartphones. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. So, I mean, I think that... Like I said, my goal here, mm -hmm. I, first of all, I don't run my department behind a desk. I'm out and about. I, I like to get out and see people in their own environments because they're more comfortable there. Mm -hmm. To get them to know me as an individual where it says, I have an issue for veterans, I can call Brian. And Brian, if he can't tell me, he'll you know, find somebody who can. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's, that's what I do. It's, it's, it's a passion. It is not a, it's not a job. But it, and I'm, my former boss said this, it's a calling and mm -hmm. not everyone can do it. But you have to definitely have the empathy. You have to have the dedication, the motivation uh, to go out with these people mm -hmm. and in their best and in their worst. Well, I think that them. comes off of you in waves, honestly. Your enthusiasm, I mean, the first time I had met you, I think it was right before you actually like started mm -hmm. on the job and you were just so excited about everything, yeah. you know? And no, and I mean, that, that's great to bring that level of energy Absolutely. because that's what it takes to make certain that these people who are in our community are getting access to everything that they possibly need. Absolutely. So one Absolutely. thing that I did want to cover, because people always ask about it, is the Memorial Day Parade. <coughs> it, it is fun and great and exciting and energetic and musical and all of those things. So tell me and a little bit about your no viewpoint on that. Um, well, believe it or not, the first week I was on a job, actually like the second day, I sat down with Kathy and, and I said, okay, tell me about this parade. Uh, because I, I've done parades mm -hmm. throughout my entire career. I've done small parades. I've done big parades. I helped with the Columbus Day Parade in East Boston two years ago. Mm -hmm. And they're actually calling me to help them again this year. Um, the mayor has said in several times that I have seen him. We, we haven't done our f formal sit down mm -hmm. yet, but every time I see him, he goes, anything you need, mm -hmm. let me know. Bigger and better. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Absolutely. Um, and I told him, I said, it will be. I'm already starting to reach out to some musical, because he wanted more bands, mm -hmm. uh, some musical organizations that we can tap to, to bring it in, but really bring in a sense of a theme. I mean, mm -hmm. we know it's Memorial Day Parade, right. but I'm going to start looking at something that's going to take us to another level nice. um, to get more people, not only in Somerville involved, but in the surrounding areas mm -hmm. to come and be a part of this as well, which I know we have like the North End Band and people from Boston right. and, and other communities come in, high school marching bands coming in from all over. Um, but the civic organizations, the nonprofits, mm -hmm. the 501c3s that we can get together to be a part of this because next year, and I've already said this and I'm, I'm making this official now, so I guess I have to do it, okay. um, is to implement a float building competition <gasps> with the Memorial Day Parade. Oh, I where, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so well, excited. I love flu. Well, the thing is, is that people don't do them anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's, that's a lot of toilet paper to be <laughs> putting on a, on a, on a flatbed. But um, I remember when I was in, uh, in high school, um, 
many centuries ago, that uh, we used to do the same thing. For our homecoming parade, there was always a competition. Right. So I'm thinking I'm going to call it the Mayor's Cup. And basically, the organization that wins it, there will be a monetary prize that will be donated to that organization mm -hmm. to further their mission. Okay. Um, and, and, and then there'll be uh, like the, the best band or, or things mm -hmm. like that. Because even though I don't believe personally in parades for Memorial Day, I never have. It's only because I feel like the celebration should be like Veterans Day or Armed mm -hmm. Forces Day or something like that. But I understand why we do right. it here and why other towns do it because it is a sense of community. Mm -hmm. um, so the parade this year, I'm not looking to make huge changes yeah. only because it's my first parade. I, there's other logistical things that I have to deal with as well. Um, but in 2017, look out. Um, <laughs> there, uh, I'm looking to do a Memorial Day concert at Assembly Row on Memorial Day mm. in that evening as a capstone for the entire weekend. Okay, that would be lovely. Um, we did it in Boston. We had 3,000 people show up the first year. I had less than six months to put it together. Wow. When I was hired, actually I had five months to put it together. Um, and it was, People said this is this is what we see as Memorial Day, because everything it was a show. It was a scripted show. There was not like long talks, mm -hmm. but everything that we did, there was a memorial part to it in right. the middle, where wreaths were presented for each war, mm -hmm. under music. You know, oh, and it, nice. it was it was really nice, and um, it it really set the weekend off. And at the very end, you're like, okay, this is why right. we celebrate, or this is why we commemorate Memorial Day. Well, I think you had mentioned that earlier too. You know, it's not barbecues and going to the beach and this and that. And I think um, an important part too that we always mentioned during the parade itself, as I had told you, I for the past few years have helped serve as the announcer mm -hmm. and really explaining like the car with the gold star mothers. Oh, like, absolutely. Like, you know, you're not you're not clapping for them. This is not something to do that. You know, it really is about respectful silence and just making more awareness, I think, of the community of understanding yes what the significance of these things are. So I think this year, as you said, you know, it'll be great to have it going forward. Mm -hmm. And then 2017, which you clearly will be back on the show before then yeah, to help hype all of this. But I did want to thank you again for taking the time You're to very come welcome. out My and pleasure. promote this. And as you said, any time you, you know, any information that needs to be shared, it really is so important for people to be aware of everything that's available. So Well, be aware um, that uh, the Somerville Vets um, uh, Facebook page hopefully is going to be up by February 1st. Oh, excellent. Uh, I will be on Twitter uh, all over, so you'll be able to find it, which will be um, at Somerville Vets. That'll just be my, my Twitter handle right mm -hmm. now. I don't know if it's going to change, but the, um, whenever I'm out and about, Mm -hmm. doing things in this community. I want people to know what's going on when something changes, when there's major changes in the VA, major changes in you know the Commonwealth's um, mm -hmm. rules and regs. These things are going to go out there. But every single time we get an opportunity to showcase a veteran in this, com in this community, mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. So I thank you very much for allowing me to be here today. Like I said, I get really excited about this because we're going to do wonderful things here in Somerville. And it will be known as a truly veteran-friendly city. Excellent. Well, thank you for your dedication to this. As I said, fresh on the job, and mm. I really look forward to working with you going forward. So thank you again, Brian. Thank you, Nancy. As always, I'd like to thank the production crew, Joe Constantine, Steve DiCarlo, and George Wood. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next month.